Dr. Yanya Lalic is an international authority on cults. She's dedicated her life to researching cults and coercion and helping other survivors recover. She's a researcher, sociologist, educator, and author of several books, including Take Back Your Life, Recovering from Cults and Abusive Relationships, Escaping Utopia, and Bounded Choice. Uh, bigger and better, busier than ever, Yanya. <laughs> Welcome. Yes. Um, Thank fun you. fact, fun fact, um, today is actually our one year anniversary of us first meeting. Really? <laughs> yeah, isn't that wow. funny? Yeah, you remember that, huh? Well, I felt like it was about a year and then I looked at my email and I was like, that's really funny because a year ago um, I reached out to you. I read your book and it helped me wake up and then I reached out to you and you helped me come up with a an exit strategy and get out of a group that I was in for 12 years. So I'm super grateful for that. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, that, thank you. I'm glad I could help. <laughs> thank you. I'm always, uh, I'm always talking about you and your book and your amazing work. And we did a foundations of recovery, uh, course together. I did your course. Um, and I know you have a new center, which I want to talk to you about what you're offering now. And, um, and I'm just glad to be able to have somewhere to send people when they need help. Um, so welcome to my little YouTube channel. <laughs> um, Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You've come a you. long way. That's for sure. I definitely have. Um, and so there's one thing that a lot of people ask me about, which I have trouble talking about, and I wanted to get your help with, and that's the topic of, uh, choice. So I know that you have written about bounded choice, and I'd love to hear you describe what that is and what's the difference between just just a simple choice and bounded choice. Okay, um, well, I'll try to make it concise. <laughs> so um, bounded choice is a is a concept and my theory that came out of my dissertation work. Um, when I got out of my cult, it took about 10 years to decide to go to grad school. So I was 50 when I started grad school. And what happened while I was in grad school is that the um, <clears throat> the Heaven's Gate suicides happened. And so my dissertation advisor said, oh, well, there you go. That's your topic. And I'm like, really? Because <laughs> I was, really wasn't sure what I was going to do in grad school. Um, <clears throat> and and I actually knew a lot about Heaven's Gate and knew members who people who'd been members for a long time. And I'd been working with a family whose daughter had joined like in the last wave um, <clears throat> of their recruitment. So I said, oh, OK. And then he said, but you should do a, a comparative study because that's far more significant than just a single case study. So he said, why don't you compare it? to the cult you were in. And I'm like, oh my God, do I have to go back there? <laughs> you know? So I did this comparative study of this sort of new agey UFO cult um, that hated this earth and couldn't wait to get back to where they thought they came from. And then the cult I was in, which was a political cult, left wing, and we love the people, you know, we love the masses and um, all, you know, everything was about bringing about social equality, et cetera or that's what it was supposed to be about. So you would think, you know, how can two cults be more different, right? So through the process of analyzing all the documents and doing interviews and analyzing videos and all of that, um, I came up with this concept of bounded choice um, because in fact, there were way more similarities than differences um, so that, you know, in my group, we might have called it one thing, but in Heaven's Gate, they did the same thing, only it was called something else, right? So we, we see these parallels across all kinds of groups. Um, and if people do get the book, Bounded Choice, there, there are a lot of charts in the back where I show this comparison. And sometimes, especially if someone's newly out of their group, they could use these charts by, by adding their another column with their cult and how their cult did those things which is similar to the assignments we used to give in the foundations course mm. um, to help people see. So the, so the sort of the point of bounded choice is to really um, explain how, how people, how it happened that people do the things they do that people on the outside can't seem to understand, right? 
So it's not just what happened to you, but how it happened to you. So, so the idea is that in this framework, I see four characteristics of cults. And the first, of course, is the authoritarian leader who's usually considered charismatic and who demands all loyalty and all obedience and there's no questioning the leader, all of that. And it's that person who typically came up with the belief system or the ideology that that, that group of people believe in and follow, right? Then secondly, in relation to that ideology, there is what I call the transcendent belief system. And transcendent doesn't mean religious in any way because it, religion has nothing to do with cults. I mean, not every cult is religious by any means, but it's a transcendent belief system in the sense that it offers you everything. It gives you the answer to the past, the present and the future, right? And part of that belief system is the idea that the end justifies the means, meaning that you can be asked to do anything as long as you're told it's for the end goal of the group, right? Then it's okay to do it. And so that's where trouble starts, right? Because <laughs> you can be asked to rob a bank or hit someone or whatever it might be, right? Um, and within that belief system, there is sort of the seeds of the indoctrination program. So the, the last two features of this sort of, I guess it's not a triangle because there's four parts of whatever that is, <laughs> triangle. <laughs> um, the, the final two parts are what I call the systems of control and the systems of influence. So the systems of control and systems is not meant to be like mechanical sounding. It's just in sociology, these are the kinds of terms we use. So the systems of control are basically the rules and, you know, the rules and regulations, the very obvious things, which will vary in different groups, but it could be what you're supposed to wear, what you're supposed to eat or not eat, how many kids you should have or not have, how you should raise your kids you know, all of the, who you should live with, where you should move to, all of those kinds of things, obvious rules and regulations that are controlling you, controlling your daily life, basically. But it, the systems of influence, I believe, are far more effective. The systems of influence are the, the, um, the social psychological mechanisms that are used to put pressure on you. So this is where, through the indoctrination program, they are sort of pushing your buttons on guilt and shame and love and anger and fear and anxiety and paranoia, all those things, all those emotional feelings that are being manipulated, right? Um, and in many ways, people don't even realize that that's what's happening because especially if you joined as an adult, not as someone born in a cult, which is quite different. Um, <clears throat> you know, all our lives we've been dealing with fear and anger and anxiety and love and all of that stuff right so you don't realize right away how these how your emotions are being manipulated and used against you right so putting all that together through the indoctrination program which can be a short amount of time it can be a long amount of time it can't and it's typically always ongoing right because people are checking up on each other reporting on each other you're in constant like classes or workshops or whatever it might be, Bible study, you know, whatever. So it's ongoing, this process. Not everyone, but most people will get to the point where you become, I guess, as we would say, a true believer, right? At that point, you, in a sense, are like a little microcosm of the cult, right? You believe everything. You believe in the leader. You obey the leader. You chastise yourself if you make a mistake or do something wrong, right? All of that. When you're in that frame of mind, that is what I call bounded choice. So what that means is, and this is this has a lot to do with the concept of free will, and this comes up a lot in court cases and also in people working through their recovery, like trying to figure out like, why didn't I leave sooner? or Why did I do such and such? Or why was I so mean to so-and-so, right? Because in those situations, you really didn't have a choice, right? You 
Uh, yes, nobody's holding a gun to your head, but they don't have to because they're in your head, right? You have essentially changed to the point where you know exactly what decisions you need to make to stay in the good graces of the group, right? So little things, you know, yes, of course, in most cases, you 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 have the freedom to make insignificant choices or decisions about, you know, whatever it might be, you know, where, I don't know, where to go shopping or whatever it might be, small decisions. But big decisions, especially something like criticizing the leader, you know, or saying to someone else, I think this is really fucked up, right? Those are the things you know you can't do, right? Because you'll be punished in some way and you'll actually all, in a sense, be punishing yourself for doing that because you know you simply cannot do that because you will lose the love, supposedly, of the leader, right? You will lose your chance at salvation or whatever they're promising you, right? Whether it's more income or good health, whatever. So your choices then are limited and constrained by the will of the leader and the will of the group. And certainly contemplating the thought of leaving the group becomes like the biggest no-no because leaving the group means not only perhaps losing your family, losing your livelihood, losing everything that you've known for X number of years, losing your sense of reality, your sense of self, but it also means losing your chance at this salvation that you've been promised, right? So the thought of leaving becomes in a sense a life or death choice, right? And it's either death, literal death, or metaphorical death, literal in the sense that some groups do train you to think that if you leave the group, you're going to die in a horrible accident or something horrible is going to happen to your family, you're going to get a dread disease, whatever. But also in the metaphorical sense that you're going to lose this grandiose chance at salvation so it becomes <clears throat> it becomes a no-brainer really that you can't make that decision that is not a choice you can make and so in the end what happens is that your your sense of self and your your own morality becomes the immorality of the cult leader and so that's when you end up doing things that you never would have done in any other situation or seeing things happen to other people in the group that you can't intervene and you can't do anything about. Um, and that's what we call moral injury. Like afterwards, people so often have, if they leave, have such guilt and shame about their time in the group and either the things they did or the things they witnessed. So because I hope that they... helped a little bit. Yeah. Um... And the the moral injury coming because you 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 question why did I why did I do that I you know and and from from a different perspective you wouldn't make those same choices but when you were in this system of bounded choice that really was your only choice exactly <clears throat> exactly and, and that's and I think that's part of the that's, that's part okay. of the um, the struggle in recovery is because um, I know when I left my group. I was, you know, I had been in top leadership. I had been in the inner circle and I, I became a real bitch, right? I modeled myself after the leader and after the second in command. And so I was nasty. I expelled people. I, you know, put people on trial. I did all these things. And so when I got out, I was like, how did I become that person? Like, oh my God, how did I do all those things? How did I hurt so many people? Um, and that's, that's a lot for people to deal with when they get out of the group. And hopefully they find <clears throat> the right kind of support, either through a, a cult informed therapist or some kind of support group or taking our courses or whatever it might be to gain a deeper understanding of how they got to that place. And it wasn't your fault, right? 
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and I, and I like that you explain it in these four dimensions and also the indoctrination that happens over time. And it's, you know, you look at where you started and when you end up and it's like, Whoa, <laughs> how did that happen? Exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. so, so tell me if this is the same or, or totally different. Um, because in, in the group I was in, they would say, they would kind of throw it out like, well, it's just your choice. They would make everything. Mm -hmm. It's just a choice. So, um, for instance, if you're, if you have a teenage child and they're suicidal, it's like, well, it's just their choice. Like if they want to live or die, um, or an, an addict who wants a drink, it's like, have a drink. It's just a choice or don't have a drink. It's just a choice. Um, there's been a number of people that have had medical issues and it's like, you have to choose to live. Like no matter what else you do, you have to choose to live. Is this the same or is this a different concept of choice? Well, what that is, is it's a, it's a, um, it's basically a belief that originated in the new age movement, um, which got very big in the sixties and seventies. Right. So one of the philosophies of the new age movement was or is that you create your own reality, right? So whatever happened to you, if you were abused as a child, somehow you created that reality. If you have AIDS, somehow you created that reality, right? So you, in a sense, um, have total control over yourself. And ultimately, the, <clears throat> the New Age belief is that we are all gods, right? And we have this control of ourselves. And so <clears throat> if I see a tree there, there's a tree there. If you don't see it, it doesn't matter. I see the tree. Um, and that can extend to this idea that you're not a victim, right? You're not a victim because you created your own reality. So no, we're not taking advantage of you. No, we're not taking all your money, no. The leader's not sexually abusing you, right? This is the reality you created for yourself. So you cannot complain, right? You cannot say you're a victim. It's a very, very useful philosophy in cult groups, for sure. So when you say that, it, it it's not true <laughs> that you create your own reality. That's a tactic. <laughs> yeah, there there is a reality. <laughs> There is no alternate reality, <laughs> right? So unless you're on drugs, I guess, then you're probably in another reality. <laughs> then you're in another reality. Well, and that's ex what you just described is what I wanted to ask you about. Because I actually came to the group I was in for 12 years from um, the whole law of attraction, create your own reality, like think your way into a good whatever thing. And right. like, the, it's the same thing, right? Right, yeah. Like if you, you know, if you say a mantra that you're going to get a million dollars, you will eventually get a million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it goes to that extreme. And then when you don't get a million dollars after you say the mantra, the number of times you're supposed to to get it, um, how do how do these groups explain, or how does the how does it work when you when that doesn't? You're not you're not working hard enough. You're not working hard enough, right? Oh, it's Work your fault. harder. <laughs> it's your fault. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's all you. Everything's always your fault. Nothing's the cult leader's fault ever. <laughs> right. I, I, I noticed that trend. Um, <laughs> and um, in Scientology and Nexium, they have, I, well, tell me if this is correct. They talk about being at cause. And that's sort of this idea that you are, uh, have the control over your energy, your thoughts. And that is this, this is like another way of saying the same thing. Yeah, it's the same. It, yeah. It's an offshoot of the same philosophy. Right. Mm. Why do cults love this way of, of dealing with people's choice? Why do they do this? Well, because it puts them at an advantage. It makes you responsible for everything right? Nothing's the leader's fault. Mm -hmm. And it keeps you constantly on eggshells, constantly shaming yourself, constantly trying to work harder, do more, you know, constantly beating yourself up. Why haven't, you know, if you're in herbal life, why haven't you made a million dollars yet? Look at that woman on stage. She's made so much money and everybody's cheering and dancing and laughing. And, you know, it, it's like, it's always meant to it's a form of the control, 
Mm. And it's, it's a great one because it's, it's kind of like cloaked in this veil of empowerment. Like we're empowering you to feel like right. you have right. control over exactly. your life. Right. When in fact they have control over your life. <laughs> yeah. So if someone is watching this and they're realizing that they have been, you know, indoctrinated mm-hmm. with that belief. Yeah. Or they're in something they want to get out. Um, I remember when we did our exit strategy, I remember two things. I know that you said a lot of things, but I remember two things. <laughs> um, <laughs> one is you told me you don't owe anyone anything. Cause I was like trying to make everyone happy and explain everything and make it easy for them for me to leave and all. And you were just like, you don't owe anyone anything. And, um, number two, and I just kept repeating <laughs> that, um, <laughs> and number, number two was you had me write down steps, uh, real simple one, two, three steps. And you're like, just reread these steps every day. Cause it can get very overwhelming, you know, when you're trying to, especially like if you have been a part of something for a long time, um, mm-hmm. is there anything else that you would say if someone is, is waking up and wants to get out? Well, I think that I think the important thing is to really make a good assessment of of the situation you're in. Like, be careful who to trust. Um, you know, generally, if you're thinking about leaving, you may not necessarily want to tell everybody that. Um, there may be only certain people you can trust with that information, if any. Um, <clears throat> I think. <clears throat> you probably want to think out. I mean, I think the, the steps is a good, you know, a good way to do it. It's like, think out. What do you need to actually make this happen? What needs to happen? What do you need to do? Are you on a compound somewhere and you have to figure out how to get from the middle of the desert to civilization, you know, and how is that going to happen? Um, are there people out there who were your friends before or relatives who you know will help you if you can make contact with them. Um, So, you know, every situation is so unique um, and it so much depends on how long you were in, what level you were at, how much you've been abused, how much energy you have. Um, So, it, it's a um, it's a process. I mean, I I wanted to get out of my cult for five years. Mm-hmm. I couldn't figure out how to get, get out. I mean, I, I just couldn't. I knew they'd come after me. I didn't have any money. I didn't have anywhere to go. Both my parents had died. I, I had a broken down car. And I used to just wish I'd be killed in a car accident. I mean, that's the only way I could see to get out. Mm-hmm. Um. So that's what I think people on the outside don't understand. It's it's not that somebody has you tied down, although in some cases that is the case, but generally it's not that you're locked in somewhere. It's that you're locked in in your mind. And that's why you need to assess very, if you've had this realization, you need to assess very carefully. Are there Are there links on the outside that you can tap that can help you make that step? Um, right. And that's why I always tell family friends, like, don't ever cut someone off on, you know, don't ever cut them off. Great. So if, if anyone's watching this and, and they have someone (laughs) who's in a group like this, that's, that's the biggest thing is just to stay in contact. Stay in contact. Don't be confrontational. Just let them know you love them. You're there for them, whatever. You'll always be there for them. You want to you want to get the sense across that you're that safe haven that they can go to where yeah. you're, you know, they're not going to get there and you're going to say, see, I told you so. You shouldn't have joined that damn group. <laughs> you know, you, you don't want to do that. So you want to always convey love and understanding and just be there for that person. Because okay. it's the hardest decision, you know, it's the hardest decision probably you'll ever make. Yeah, absolutely. And they can use all the support that they can get. Um, Yanya, exactly. I know you, you. I know you're so busy, and I want to let you go. But can you tell anyone who's watching where they can find you and what what you have on offer now at your amazing new center? Okay. So uh, last year I started a nonprofit um, which has tax deductible status, which is very exciting. 
Um, so I have a team of people working with me. It's called the Lalich Center on Cults and Coercion. And um, we offer discussion groups for survivors of cults, narcissistic relationships and families, um, the troubled teen industry, if people know what that is, those horrible programs where teens are sent to wilderness camps or boarding schools. And in those cases, they really are locked up. Um, so we have discussion groups for those kinds of survivors. We also have discussion groups for people who were born or raised in a cult situation. Um, I'm hoping soon to start a family discussion group, uh, just, just support for families, because often they feel like there's no one they can talk to. I soon want to start a gay discussion group for people who were gay or thought they were gay while they were in a group. Um, and I think there's some special needs there. Uh, we are going to be doing our courses again. Um, some are just for survivors and some are for anybody. Um, we're going to be doing a course on how to be an ethical coach, uh, which is a big thing. I think similar to the world you came out of, like these coaches today are a dime a dozen and there's no regulation. Um, we're going to do a course on how um, how cults exploit religious traditions by a professor of religion uh, who was born and raised in a cult. Um, we'll be doing our regular recovery courses probably sometime in the summer. Okay. Uh, we'll be starting those. Um, we do some live Zoom events that are really a lot of fun um, that lots of people can come to. Um, <clears throat> and we do offer scholarships. We try to keep our prices very low, but some people can't even afford the $25 for the discussion group. So we do offer scholarships and we, which is why it's great that we're now tax deductible. We're hoping we'll get some donations coming in. Um, we have a temporary website at uh, www.lalichcenter.org where people can sign up for our newsletter or fill out a form saying what they're interested in or make a donation if that's what they'd like to do. Um, it's really exciting. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 some years and I felt like, you know, as I was saying to you earlier, I'm 78 years old now. So I feel like it's time to think about what's next <laughs> in whatever world. <laughs> and I want to make sure that there are enough people trained and, and ready to like carry on with the work that I've been doing. So it's amazing work and I'm just so grateful you and your book and your team and your class was there when I um when I got out and you really um I I think without that it would have taken a lot longer to um to leave and to recover and I'm still recovering of course but just having those resources and is so important. How did, I, did, did someone refer you to me? How did you find me? Yes, to... Tarzan. It was Tarzan. That's what I Tarzan. thought. Tarzan. Yeah. Yeah and how do you know Tarzan? So Tarzan is a is a copywriter and I'm a marketer. So I was learning, you know, writing uh, from her and she sent out this email and it was like subject line, how to spot a cult leader. And I was like, wait, what? Um, and I and I it just was that uh, that aha moment. And I read her email about, you know, her experience with a coach who was a cult leader. And I was like, coaches can be cult leaders. Um, <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize. And then I, and she mentioned you and your book and I got the, the take back your life life book. And I remember opening it going, maybe I'm in a cult. And I like <laughs> just, and you're, you're describing a very different group than my group, but the tactics and the, and the systems exactly. were, so the same that I was like, whoa, um, okay, I need to get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I think Tarzan will be teaching the um, how to be an ethical coach course along with Kath. Oh. I don't know if you also know Kathleen. That's um, amazing. Oh, yeah. that's so good. Yeah. That's yeah, uh, that'll be we great. We, we definitely need that. And, um, and that's, yeah, a, l a lot of what, yeah, the, the people that I work with still are, are coaches and marketing is so culty, you know, the systems of coercion and it's just like the whole industry. Yeah. So that's amazing. Oh, thank you, Yanya. I will let you go.
I'm so right. grateful. It was, yeah, it was great to catch up. And um, maybe you can help us with our marketing someday. <laughs> I would love to. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah, we you, need Danya. A okay, take care. Thanks so much for you inviting too. me. Thank Good you. to see you. You too. Ciao.